and full beans. Ooh, that's nice. A lot of people might think that starting up a car company is a crazy idea. Just ask Elon Musk. It isn't cheap. It takes a lot more time and effort than most people could possibly imagine. And guess who the guy was responsible for the chief design work on the Tesla Model S? None other than Peter Rawlinson, who just so happens to be the CEO and chief technical officer of Lucid Car Company. So after his successes at Tesla, apparently he was still hungry for more. He decided that he still had more to offer. And Lucid decided that what they wanted to do was to start from a completely clean sheet and reimagine just exactly what the electric car could be. We're gonna take a deep look into this today, the Lucid Airdream, the first of its kind, and see exactly what generation two of the electric car might look like. The Lucid Airdream is their first entrance to market and as such, they've decided to hit the ground at the top to begin with. It's a performance model and the sticker price is $175,000, but there's only a limited number of these to begin with, 520. Why? Because 520 is the optimal mile range of this vehicle. So in case you're a regular viewer and you're thinking, okay, Brian, well, it's a limited run vehicle. That's great. It's a concept, but what does that have to do with me? The answer is that in order to establish everything that needs completely redesigning from scratch, it makes the most sense to start at the top in order to provide all of the tech you need for then coming down to mass market appeal further on. So the Lucid Air range is supposed to expand way beyond this. Well, this is officially the first car to break the 500 mile barrier. And if all of that sounds like a lot of, yeah, okay, on a test track with a backwind with the right direction happening, no, 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 that's a very realistic figure. Now, this is the performance model. So this car, as it stands here right now, is capable of delivering 452 miles of range. And that's not crazy fantasy. We have taken this out for extensive driving today. And I can say that even playing with it and having a lot of fun, you can still expect a realistic range of 400 miles. So how did they do it? Well, come on, let's take a closer look and find out. So let's start around at the front of this car. And I think naysayers or people who like a bit more flair and dynamism might take their first look at the Lucid and say, well, doesn't it look a little bit kind of, I don't know, plain? Well, there's a lot of story behind that. First of all, you have to consider that the way that this car was designed was always going to be function over form to begin with. The function dictates the form. So this car has a drag coefficient of 0.2 and a lot of technology had to go into achieving that. But in redesigning and reimagining exactly what's possible, they've also changed the entire architecture of how they think about the car. Sound dramatic? Well, just consider this light array at the front. In order to achieve this, which crushes the entire front area here and massively positively influences not only the aerodynamicism of the car, but also the available storage in the front, they had to completely redesign the way that headlights work. These air intakes suck air in off the road and then actually create twin tornado effects directly behind the bumper on either side. And the reason they've done that is because the radiator, rather than having one standard radiator approach, has been split into two. It's either side of this bumper. And by creating a vortices of this air behind it, they're able to hit the entire area of that radiator all at once. Now that maximizes the cooling potential instead of focusing the air draw only on one specific area. And in doing that, they not only increase the efficiency of the cooling, but they also maximize the potential load space of the front. You can see another way in which the aerodynamics have been so inventively approached just here. There's a buildup of pressure that is created just here on the front edge of the car. So there's actually a channel here through which the air can come. And then if you look slightly higher up on the bonnet, this is where that air is pushed and it comes right through the bonnet, right up, forcing that air down the side flank of the vehicle. Four meters 97 or 196 inches in length. Several journalists have said 
that this car visually reminds them of French cars, especially of the 1940s. I don't know that I can see that, but what this really evokes to me is Americana, especially the muscle cars of yesteryear. I think it's a really great mix of both those big, bold, impressive flanks, but also the modern of the new. Just look at this roof. This is one piece of glass that stretches all the way back to here and then more glass coming through. So an entirely glass canopy. And in order to make that work, only aluminium has been used elsewhere on the chassis, giving it the strength and the light weight that it needs in order to provide the performance that it provides. I like greatly, for example, this light blade that runs the entire length of the boot and the styling choice they made to make the boot one piece. So if you have a look here, there's no seam because the boot runs all the way round into the side. And that's going to do two things, give you a massive opening. When we open this up, we'll take a look in a little bit, but also stylistically make sure that there's no interruption to this line that comes right the way through. Speaking of boots, let's take a look inside this one and see just how much available space there is at the rear. Well, 626 liters of load. And if you're struggling to see back there because of the black, let me flip down one of the seats so you can get a little bit of light through just to get a sense. Now, if you're wondering why it is that you only get latches to operate these seats in the back of this car, the reason is something that Tesla have experienced, which is charming people going through the quarter lights to access the boot at the rear. Well, as a security feature, that's been removed from the Lucid, so you don't have to worry about anything being put back here. As you can see, you have rather a lot of room in this boot, plenty enough room for two decent sized suitcases. You also have a 60-40 split on the rear seats and a ski hatch back here to fit your skis. There is a further storage area underneath here which is going to be perfect for cables and any ancillaries. Sadly, we've gone through the age when people think it's necessary to put spare tires in cars. Still not completely convinced about that, but I guess that is the way that the industry is going. And nice storage bins either side to drop down even more things that you might want to store. Here, I think we have a bespoke bag that's ready to receive all of the charging cables. This could be one of those takes where I stand here for about an hour. <laughs> <laughs> you can also open the frunk using the key. Let's take a look at that. Again, please make some allowance for the fact it's pre-production, so they work a little bit better than this. Now this is really one of the most obvious statements of where all of that space saving that took place within the front bumper design has really paid off. I don't know if you've taken the chance to see our reviews of either the Taycan S or um, recently the Mercedes. If not, then please check them out. We'll link to them below. But this, by anybody's standards, is a very large frunk. When you look at the opening aperture here, you think, well, that's not so impressive. I mean, it's pretty good, but it's not endless. Ah, but that's before you've had a look down here at the storage bin just look at this available space it's huge all right well i've played with the key for a bit now so i hope i won't embarrass myself quite so much two quick squeezes of the key <laughs> there we are and the car is unlocked and as you can see the visual cue to tell you that that's going on is that these handles have raised prominently so you can gain access to the vehicle as you do that and you open it up you get your first glimpse into the cabin. And right from the start, you can see this mix of very high quality materials on the door. Now, I think it's important that we do mention sustainability. I have talked to Lucid at length about their choice of materials. We have a wool here and there are leather options on the seats. They are very keen on the idea of sustainability. They're not quite yet sold on the idea that it should have an animal free interior as its only option, but they want to move in that direction. So I think as this is their first car to market, they're maybe just a bit nervous about starting that way, but I would hope very much that's where they're gonna end up. 
In the meantime, the materials they have gone with are really excellent quality. I'm five foot 10 in height or 178 centimeters. And as you can see, even though I have a particularly long torso, there is plenty of room left available for me thanks to this glass roof. What you're looking at here is a 32 inch 5K display. And if that's ringing your bells and thinking, ah, oh, that just reminds me of something. To me, it does look a little bit reminiscent of the Taycan. I have to be honest, I think I prefer their execution slightly, but they have had a bit more practice in fairness. Sorry, Lucid, that's a bit unfair, isn't it? But I just like the way that that sits together. This looks different to me. And the reason I think I find that a little jarring is I'm just not quite sure immediately what's here for me to interact with in a tactile way and what's here for purely visual purposes. Now that has been in some way signposted for me by this segmentation. As you can see, this middle section here is the effective driver's display. Now Lucid have said that they wanted to make a decision at least at launch to really have a fairly sparse offering in terms of what the driver actually sees. They want the focus to remain on the road. They don't want too much extraneous information here. Now, because I have a very long torso, this steering wheel is set pretty low down. And that means in most cars that I drive, the very top of the display is usually covered up over the steering wheel. If, by the way, anybody's really picky out there and says, why do you do that, Brian? That's not how you should approach things. I spent a long time reading up on this. The correct way to place your steering wheel is to put your arms out in front of you and to rest your wrists on there. And because of my dimensions, as you could see, I could even have that wheel a little bit lower. That would be a bit more comfortable for me. But as you can understand, that would block off the instrument cluster. It's not only in this car, that's in every car I drive. So I'm just used to that. That's why I'm a huge fan in my life of head-up displays. They decided not to put one in here, even though there is the space within the dashboard to fit one. And the reason is they just wanted to keep this simple, uncluttered, and only contain the information you need. And I think that's nicely presented. You could say it's a little bit dull, that's personal taste, but I think the opposite um, can be true, that it's a little bit challenging to have far too much information available to you, and that seems to be a growing trend within driver cockpits. So honestly, I'm a bit relieved just to find a display that only tells you what you need to know. If I drag down from here, it seamlessly goes straight into the middle section here, which means the passenger can check out any music they want without interfering with your line of sight. That's a pretty neat trick. This is also a pretty neat trick. Push this button right here. And the central display disappears into the dashboard which shows you up this large storage bin right underneath it. That's a smart use of space. I don't think you need to get in there all the time. It's nice that it's available and it's nice to get that out of the way sometimes. And if we want to get it back, we push on the same arrow and back it comes. This is going to be your standard welcome screen. And this is the most important feature that you're standardly going to want to access. This is where the drive modes are located. Now, I would have much preferred a physical button for this, but in fairness to Lucid, when you actually start driving this car, as you can see from my arm length, it's very natural to switch between these modes without actually needing to think about it too much. The thing that's a little bit less obvious is if I want to change the level of regeneration, I have to push and hold and then change like that. Now that's obviously something that you're not going to be that enthusiastic about messing around with while you're driving. I think that's something that they're going to be looking at a little bit later on in terms of a later software iteration and how they want to develop things. Little quirky feature is this button here for the glove box. Push that and it opens. Well, that's quite a nice touch. I can't help but wonder if by the time I can afford to buy one of these third hand, will it still work then? I'm not completely convinced, but I'll look forward to finding out. Now, somewhat controversially, but quite unsurprisingly, all of the heating and cooling can be accessed through here. If you have a look down at the bottom, that's gonna be this button here. Now, 
They said in their research they acknowledged that some people still like having tactile physical buttons. Hello, that would be me. But this isn't really my idea of that or how it works. This is my knockout feature for the front. Look at this. Floating front sun visors. I've never seen that before. Does that exist on any other car? I can't think of one, but I'd love to know if you can. Look at that. That's just really stylish and effortless. How effective that is in day-to-day -day driving, I'll be really interested to see when we take the car out. Steering wheel's a bit of an odd one for me. I like the shape and the position is good. And this approach to styling not only looks nice, but it feels good too. The bit that I have a problem with is the diameter of this steering wheel. My favorite steering wheel ever is the Porsche uh, Taycan, which is not an original steering wheel. It's used on lots of other Porsches, but it's tight and it's responsive and it's slim. And that's really important because it's a performance car and it needs to be agile. So the steering has to reflect that. Now here in this car, you have tight responsive steering, but this to me is a very large diameter steering wheel. Well, the back is really the big story of this car. Wow. It's cavernous. Now, this car has a 22 unit battery pack, and that's really important because that's there to maximize the range. You can also get the lower editions of this car with an 18 unit battery pack. Now that does obviously impact on the total range, but as the overall total range of this vehicle is so incredibly impressive, it's not gonna bother most people, but it is gonna make a big difference to what happens back here because this is the area in which the battery packs are removed from if you don't have the extra ones. And that creates an extra depth available for feet of around about that. And that really changes the comfort back here. Now this is nice. And as you can see, I have acres of space. This seat in front is set for me and I have very short legs. So it's a much fairer comparison if I slide over and show you how much room there is when the seat is set for a normal human being. But look at that. That's crazy amounts of room. You really can sit three people back here in the most comfort. And for an electric car, especially one that really isn't terribly long, that's a very big achievement. But not only that, the camera comes round and you have a look at my head. Because I have all of this leg room, I'm free to sink down into that seat slightly and really pleasingly, despite that coupe line, look at my head, I have space. I don't know if you've checked out Thomas's video for the EQS, please do. I just have to believe that that car was designed really thinking that only children were ever gonna sit in the back of it. A combination of massive amounts of leg space and very comfortable headroom mean that I could travel a long way in the back of this in really, really good comfort. All of the materials are finished with just as much care and attention in the back as they are in the front. Of course, you have your own heating and cooling controls. You have a nice storage area back here. It really does feel like you are sitting in a premium car. And given that this is their first attempt at doing this, you have to be impressed with what they've achieved. Sticking with that theme of comfort, when you want to gain entry to the rear doors, you might standardly expect that that's as much room as you're gonna have. Well, a 90 degree opening on the rear door here. So look how easy that is to gain and access to and exit from. Combine that with a self-closing door. It's really quite hard to see how you could have an awful lot more comfort back there. The battery pack provides 118 kilowatt hours and over 300 watt charging. Now, one of the smartest things, in my opinion, that Lucid achieved when they designed this car was to make their charging port universally accessible. And what that means is whatever the charging situation you have available for this car is, you will be able to access it. And that's thanks to a very clever unit that sits within the car, which they've called a Wunderbox or Wonderbox. And that has not only the battery management system, but also a uh, power inverter system, which allows you not only to put power in, but also take power out. So further down the route as the, the, the technology develops, you'll also be able to use this as an energy sink for your house. 
that's a pretty bold statement, but given the rising cost of energy, that's actually quite an appealing prospect. We managed to find a nice bit of almost open road out amongst the redwoods just outside of San Francisco. Sadly, not the giant redwoods, but probably it's a bit harder to drive at speed around there anyway. Obviously, there are speed restrictions here, but what we do have lots of are really nice windy roads, and that's an excellent place to just get a feel for how good the handling of this car is. So it's not a light car, it's over 2,000 kilos or over 5,000 pounds in weight. And when you start throwing it around, although you can feel that weight, what you get more than anything else is a deep sense of being impressed about how all of these components are put together in order to provide torsional stiffness to the whole way the car sits. One of the things the designers told us, which I guess is pretty obvious, but still pretty cool, is that the advantage of electric cars over internal combustion engines because they don't need to fit any components underneath, you really can create a perfect environment underneath the car for the flow of air. So a completely flat plane. But one of the things that's particularly impressive about the bottom of this car is apparently that isn't an optimal aerodynamic environment. What you want is a slight bow at the bottom to create the lift where you want it, the downforce where you don't. And needless to say, what the battery pack wants to be is completely flat and level. So if you want to put a slight curve in, well, that is a significant extra amount of effort. And you might start to ask yourself, is that really worth it? Well, when you start driving this car and you feel the way that it behaves, nothing about it feels in any way stressed or forced. The components work so very well together. It's not just one thing in this car, it's everything together. Loads of weight's been saved here by using less material, but more materials that work well together. So the strength of the battery packs and the casing themselves form an integral part of the torsional stiffness of this car. It's just one of many different features about how material selection has been so key in making the chassis exactly what it should be to support this additional weight and yet still give you the driving profile that you want. That's a lot of words. What it means in practice is when you put your foot down and throw this car around a corner, it feels entirely intentional and so much fun. I don't feel as if I need to put any effort into this at all. And bluntly, I feel like I could go at least twice as fast as this without in any way being bothered about it. And I don't mean that in a bad way, as in it's not exciting. It's very exhilarating and just really cool because what you're experiencing is technology that just works. And that's really exciting. And what I really want to try quickly here is changing my driving profile. At the moment, I'm still in smooth and I want to see what happens if I flip the system over to something a little bit more dynamic. So let's go with Swift to start with. And as you can see, it takes a bit more attention than I'm comfortable with to switch those modes, but this is Swift, look at that. A more dynamic driving stance on the road, steering's more responsive. Still, absolutely nothing, nothing to worry about at all. The car feels so within the bounds of what it's comfortable to do absolutely effortless. Let's kick it up a notch and see what happens then. Now, because I want to keep the eyes on the road, I'm going to ask my cameraman if he would kindly change the modes for me. And he'll Sorry. get a confirmation stream, which is going to ask him to say that that's definitely what he wants. And if we're lucky, I'm going to drop back just a little bit so we can make the most of that while we catch the others. It seems almost a shame to drive through this countryside at such speed because it's so very beautiful. But the handling of the car is also pretty beautiful. Look at that. Just effortless. Just a little bit more precision than you find in the more gentle riding modes. But to be completely honest with you, it's such a pleasure to come here and do this. I think if I owned this car, 
I really wouldn't take it out of smooth all that much. There's just no need. It's so nicely executed and it still has more than enough power. That's smooth, don't forget. Now it's definitely a little bit softer going into those corners, a little bit less precise. But it's so far beyond what you could reasonably expect. You just don't need the extra, but it's there if you want to give it a try anyway. So the standard driving mode you're going to be using for the vast majority of your time with this vehicle is smooth. Why? Because it gives you more than enough of what you need to enjoy the car. But picture the scene, you're driving home from work, it's been a long day, you're cruising, and then suddenly you get a little bit of open road. Well, why not take advantage of just what that power can deliver? That's how complicated it is to stick it in Swift. Now, before I open it up and show you what that means, I want to talk just briefly about regeneration. So anyone who's owned an electric car before or even tried one understands the concept of regeneration. If you're not familiar with that, basically, as opposed to braking, electric cars are more and more aiming for one pedal use. That means the motors or the batteries are used to regenerate and recuperate the energy lost through slowing down by using a dynamo. And that way you don't have to use the brakes. So what that means, though, is that you're going to not have the rolling quality of an internal combustion engine car, and that can be quite off-putting while you're getting used to it. So most electric car manufacturers will offer you at least two different levels of regeneration while you're getting the hang of it. For one pedal driving, really you want the full beams, so the highest regeneration available, but that's going to feel very unnatural and strange the first time you use an electric car. So most people start off in normal. Now for personal preference, I would always go with a three status system. That's off, then normal, then high. Why? Because if you're not used to the technology, it is very off-putting indeed. One pedal driving is something that needs to be learnt in much the same way that using a clutch needs to be learnt if you're only used to an automatic. So I'm a bit disappointed that currently the Lucid only has those two states, but I'm more disappointed that currently, if you want to change that state, you have to do it through this digital display. Well, I hope this gets captured by the middle camera, but I want you to see what that means. As you've already gathered, I can change these modes with only a cursory glance. I can't do that with a regeneration. If I push down on this, you hopefully will be able to see that the braking option comes up. Now, I've already spent too long looking at this display to make me comfortable, and as hopefully you can see, that option has now gone away because I didn't respond quickly enough. What does that mean in the real world? This is on high regeneration. I'm currently driving 60 miles an hour. If I take my foot off, that deceleration is all recuperation. This, by the way, is the acceleration that you experience with Swift. Nice. So not quite the full beans but I think enough for most people on a regular day. Certainly enough for a road in these conditions, but you didn't tune in to watch standard boring everyday driving. So what happens if we want the full beans? Well, first of all, we've got to hit the sprint button. And then in order to make absolutely sure that's what we meant, as is fairly common to other manufacturers, we click on confirm. So now I'm in sprint. And now I don't really care what the state of regeneration is because what I care about is what happens when I punch down. So the driving dynamics of the car change in each one of these states, softer and more comfortable. Obviously, you're going to get that in smooth and full beans. Ooh, that's nice. Obviously, that's what you're going to get in sprint. Now, as I said, I don't think you're going to be using that every two minutes. But the cooling architecture of this car means that in total difference to many other electric performance vehicles, you should be able to do that again and again and again and again. And that's really important. Not because I think you're going to want to do it, but you're going to want to feel that you could if you did. And along with so many other unique innovations, the way that this car removes the heat as those batteries start heating up and most important, as the electric motor is pushed, is really innovative and different. We're going to talk about that a little more later, hopefully with one of the guys who's worked so hard on this system. But for now, let's put this back in smooth 
and just enjoy the scenery. Well, in order to do that, I think we have to at least talk somewhat about this roof system that we have here. It's just my opinion, but this looks great from the outside. It's a real innovation, but from an inside user point of view, does it give me anything that benefits me for the experience of having it? Well, I quite like having this floating rear visor. I think that looks cool. The way in which this has been integrated into the top to provide all the access for the sensors and the rear view mirror is also very cool. But is it as cool as being able to drive down this road with a panoramic roof that allows me to taste the salt in the air? No, it simply isn't. Once you start putting this car into a crosswind, the noise from the wind is actually quite significant. And this road surface is good, but once you start driving on a little rough road surface, there's a fair amount of cabin noise from that too. So it isn't without issue on the wind front. Am I maybe imagining that some of that has to do with all glass and no insulation in the ceiling? Maybe. Is that fair? Maybe, maybe not. I think my favorite particular feature is the charging. Anyone who's driven an electric car over any distance knows the misery of being told that a charging point's available, but it isn't, or it's vandalized, or it doesn't work, or any one of another myriad range of issues. Well, they really have figured out a solution to that on this car, and that's a thing called the Wunderbox. Please forgive me, any German guys listening to this. And what that does, on top of a whole range of complex other things, is allows this car to charge more or less anywhere. And that's huge because although Lucid have partnered with uh, American Energy, I think it is in this country, to provide access to their growing network, which is going to be significant and large, this car and later versions of it will be sold globally. And obviously that will have a different offering arranged for it. But whatever your offering is, Lucid didn't want that to be an issue to this car. They wanted to make sure that wherever you were, you would be able to get access to the power you needed. But for now, what it means is that this car at a high charge point will be able to get to a 200 mile range in no more than 12 minutes of charging. Wow. Now they've configured the batteries specifically in order to be able to get that. So, so far, my takeaways from the driving experience, excellent seating position, excellent seat, steering really precise and nice, let down badly by a spongy, massive feeling steering wheel. So driver's instruments further hurt by two short stalks that are awkward for me to operate with my tiny, tiny hands. Braking, well, you don't really need to get into worrying about that too much with excellent recuperation, but I would have preferred to have had more modes of that to offer me more flexibility. Overall, I can tell you that this car really doesn't show you what it's got until you start pushing it. And that's when everything comes together beautifully. So I think they've done an awful lot at answering all of the problems people have with the concept of electric vehicles overall. But that doesn't really address the central question of any car, which is yes, but is it any fun to drive? Yes, yes, and yes is my answer. Am I getting as big of a kick out of this as I get off the Taycan? No. Do I think this is as practical? It's a lot more practical. I'm definitely gonna feel better driving my family around in this. I also don't think that it's gonna get egged when I leave it in a supermarket car park for looking too expensive or being too cool. I think it's an immense amount of car for the proposition, but more than all of that, I don't see Porsche being able to bring an affordable product to market anytime soon. And this, I think, is going to be incredibly viable to normal people within a comparatively short space of time. Why? Because they already invested all of the money they needed to in making a product that works. That means when you want to make it cheaper, you already spent the money. That means you don't have to recoup as much of the spend in the sales price of the vehicle itself. So I'm incredibly optimistic about this vehicle to deliver real value over the long term, not only for the company, but also for the people who purchased this car.